Hello, this is Steve Sanangelo from the SRS Rock Report with a new important video. It's highlighted in red. It is on the energy cliff, as I had told that I would put this for the um, uh, public YouTube viewers. And it's why the US and the global economy are heading towards a depression that never ends. Now, the reason for that has to do with uh, the two mentalities that are in basically in the public today. You've got either the one on the left or the one on the right. And most people, I would say 99% of people think we're, we're heading towards a high-tech future. This is the cartoon Jetsons, the flying cars in the 1960s with Bitcoin, robots, all powered by free energy or renewable energy. And this is where we're going, because if you ask them, what do you think the future is going to be like, uh, your friends or family, uh, co-workers, they're going to say, well, gosh, look at technology, what it's done in the last two, three decades, two, you know, 20, 30 years, what can it be like in the next 20, 30 years? And so that's the typical response. It's technology. Technology is going to solve all our problems, and we're going to have all this advanced robotics to do everything for us. Unfortunately, I, I'm, I believe more in the energy cliff, and that's due to the data. Not that that's because I believe in it. That's just what the data is showing us and the subsequent depression and ongoing collapse of the economies. Now, uh, we, we had the 1930s depression. And when that happened, you could see all of the men and standing in line for the bread line in 1931. But the pandemic is a preview of where, of where we're headed. And instead of standing in line due to the petro economy today, people drive. Uh, their cars to pick up food. And we're seeing, this was earlier, this was as of April, uh, when the pandemic first hit the U.S. Now in the second wave, we're seeing a lot more uh, food banks uh, all, over the, all over the country. Now, the basis of my analysis, even though I talk a lot about gold and silver, uh, is that energy drives a global economy, not finance. Finance, the financial markets and the banks central banks steer the economy. Now, the reason why gold and silver are so important and they have been for thousands of years is because gold and silver are stores of energy equivalent value. And they have been so for thousands of years. Nothing's changed. Even though uh, fiat currency is now in the forefront, gold and silver on the rear view mirror, it, it doesn't mean that gold and silver are no longer stores of energy equivalent value. And I'll explain that here in a few minutes. Now, as I mentioned, it wasn't the Fed and central bank money printing and QE policies that pulled the global economy out of the 2008, 2009 recession. It was global oil production growth, mostly from the US shale oil industry. And this, this is a chart showing from 2007 to 2020 January, the olive color is the rest of the world. And then the red is the United States and that's uh, crude oil, condensate, natural gas, liquids and other liquids production. Most of the growth came from the US. So you can't have money printing unless you have the energy to back it up. And so it was the energy that came from mostly the US shale industry that propped up the US and global economy. And why is that the case? Well, this chart explains it perfectly. This is global oil production uh, minus the US and Canada. Let's just call it the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is shown here in the olive color. US is in blue and Canada oil production is in red. From 1997 to 2008, the rest of the world minus the US and Canada, increased oil production 12.7 million barrels a day. We can see it went up 12.7 million barrels a day. Interestingly, Canada and the United States actually fell 0.7 million barrels a day over that same period. Now, since the financial crisis in 2008, it totally flipped. The rest of the world, minus US and Canada, fell 0.6 million barrels a day. US and Canada increased 12.6 million barrels a day. And we could see that. We could see that it's been basically flat. There's a little bit of rise here, but net it's down. The rest of the world is down 0.6 million barrels a day over the last, last 11 year period. Whereas the US and Canada are up 12.6 and the United States has accounted for 82% of that growth. 
Now, why is that bad news? Because most of that growth came from what is this little pimple here called tight oil, the brief uh, lifespan of tight oil. This is the US oil production going back. This is by Art Berman, a geologist right here, artberman.com going all the way back to uh, 1900. We had US conventional oil production peak in 1970. Then we brought on offshore and Alaska, which gave us another peak but it's been continued to decline until we brought on the tight oil. Now, Art Berman is saying that uh, the peak was 12.2, and this is just crude oil and condensate. This isn't natural gas liquids and other. The U.S. produces over 5 million barrels of natural gas liquids. That, would, that's, that is what does a lot of fertilizers, uh, uh, plastics, chemicals. But he, he says within by September 2021, it's going to fall down to 7.7. .7. This is the energy cliff physically. This is not the net energy. This is actually his forecast is going to be a, a huge decline in tight oil production. And I talk about that on the USS Rocker Report. Now, why also, why is that bad news? Uh, Jean-Marc Jankovici, I've shown this uh, slide several times. He did a presentation in front of the OECD showing the first limiting factor to the economy lies in the ground. Unfortunately, modern day economists don't believe in that. They seem to believe in an energy tooth fairy. But in the red line here, it's total world oil consumption or production. They go hand in hand. Oil production and consumption is about the same number. Three-year average compared to the total world GDP per capita three-year average. So as oil production or consumption falls, so does the GDP. And we can see it's been running parallel pretty much for the last several decades. So unless you have oil production growth, you don't have GDP growth. And what has been the major source of oil production? The U.S. shale industry. So we can, we can thank the U.S. shale industry for propping up the uh, U.S. economy and global economy for the last 10, 12 years. But that's not going to, that's, there's, that's not going to happen again in the next 10, 12 years. Uh, that was, there's no second chance or second inning. It's, it's done, unfortunately. Now, I put together this chart. I don't think anybody has done this chart before. This is U.S. average oil production for each decade and average percentage increase for each decade for 1910s to 2010s. Now, Back in 1910s, during the decade, uh, the uh, average oil production for the U.S. was 766,000 barrels a day. This chart is in 1,000 barrels a day. In the 1920s, it really jumped to 1,949 or 1.9 million barrels a day. In the 20s, the increase, the average annual increase in oil production growth was 12.8%. It's no wonder the U.S., the, it was known as the Roaring Twenties. As the U.S. brought on all this oil from Texas, Oklahoma, California, even in the, in the Midwest in Kansas, there was all this growth. Uh, people were moving to the cities. There were cars being built. It was, it was like the decade, uh, the Roaring Twenties. Well, then we had the Depression. Even though we had the depression, we could see oil production for the decade moved up to 2.7, 2.8 million barrels a day, but it increased 3.6% for the for the for the average. Now, during World War II in the 1940s, it went up to 4.5 million barrels a day. There was a 5.3% annual increase in oil production. But even though the production continued to go up each decade, the average the percentage increase continued to fall. And then in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, it was negative. And this is when the US really started to import a lot of oil. In the 2000s, we were importing uh, three quarters. I think we were producing about 5 million barrels a day. We were, we were importing 12 to, to 14 million barrels a day, almost three quarters of our production, of our consumption. So, and then we see the big increase here during the, the 2010s, and that was shale at 4.7%. Now, I'm showing you that because of this next chart. This is the U.S. real gross domestic product average percentage change for each decade, 1940s to 2010s. So, in the 1940s, the U.S. GDP increased 6% a year for the entire decade, average. And that was due to the oil increasing about 5.3% each year. 
And then as the decades went on, we see we had 4.2, 4.5% in GDP growth, but then it continued to trend lower. And by the 2000s, the, the growth was in the United States GDP was only 1.9% a year. It was trending lower. Now, right here, it went to 2.3%, but we, the US shale oil production was a major factor in providing higher growth in the 2010s. Now, this I'm going to show why this was a lot, this was actually a lot lower if we in incorporate the debt because the GDP does not take into account the massive increase in debt. So this is the US real gross domestic product. Again, average percentage change for each decade, 6%, 4.2, just like the last chart. And then the debt to GDP. Now, during the 1940s, in 1945, because of World War II, the U.S. had increased, uh, had a lot of debt uh, to fund the uh, war. So in 1945, the debt to GDP was 100%, but the average for the decade was 76. Now, each decade that went on, we see that the, G the debt to GDP fell to 33% in the 1970s. Why? Because the U.S. had rising oil production. The rising oil production allowed us to generate the economic activity to pay down that debt. But the problem is as our production peaked and we started importing more, we could see that the debt to GDP in the 2010s was 100%. Now that's for the entire decade, much higher than it was in the 40s. The problem here is, uh, the shale industry is going to collapse. And so as you saw in that Art Berman chart, we're not going to see uh, another huge leg higher in your shale oil production. The peak is, is here and now we're, we're going to see the collapse, which means the debt to GDP is gonna get even worse. We're not going to be able to pay back that debt. So if we look at this next chart, well, it, it basically shows, I, I wanna show that it's, it was due to the debt that allowed the GDP to rise. And I believe if we go to this chart here, this is two, uh, total US debt, all sectors, this is public and private, versus US GDP and the total US energy consumption from 1947 to 2019. Now, from 1947 to 1970, right when US oil production peaked, conventional, the increase was 2.2 times the energy consumption in the United States. The GDP increased 4.3 and the debt increased 4.4 times. Now from 1970 to 2019, the GDP increased 20 times. The energy only increased one and a half times. Now this is all energy. This is our oil consumption, natural gas, coal, uh, electricity and nuclear and some hydro and renewables. But it, 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 the GDP was mostly driven by the energy increase, but now the GDP has been mostly driven by the debt increase. So a lot of this, the, the GDP that we see, 1.9% in the 2000s and 2.3% is much, much lower due to the debt. Now, I talk about the energy return on investment. It's the EROI. Some people call it uh, the EROEI, energy return on energy investment. However, one of the leading minds of, of the um, energy return on investment is Charles Hall. He does a lot of papers on the energy return on investment, and he uses EROI. You know, either way, I think the EROI is simpler to understand, but this is the typical 1920s well, oil well. The oil was um, not that far down in the ground, uh, 1,000 feet, maybe 1,500 feet. And the technology that was needed to, to drill and access the oil was very simple. Now let's fast forward to today. This is the low oil EROI 2010 to 2020. This is a complex shale fracking well. This is a gas well. This looks like it's in the Northeast, the Marcellus area. Now here is the, the well right here. This is the wellhead. Uh, before all this equipment came here, they put the pad down and then they brought in the big drilling rig and they drilled the well. Normally it's about a mile down and then it's two miles horizontal. That's a typical. 
10,000 feet horizontal and about 5,000 feet down. They remove the drilling platform and then they bring in all this. Now think about all the energy it takes to run this. These, all these tractor trailers have these pumpers. That's all these pumpers. And they're pushing all the, this, the water fret to frack and the sand in, in these pipes that go down into the wellhead. Now, it's not just the energy that it takes to run all this. Think of all the energy it took to manufacture all this equipment because a lot of this equipment wasn't needed before fracking. This is highly specialized equipment. So the technology, the engineering that went into designing all this equipment, all the, the different plants that were built to uh, produce this, this kind of equipment, that's part of the energy return on investment that's not included. So it's, that's the reason why for the low energy return on investment, it just takes a lot of energy to get this energy back in the good old days. It was very simple. That's why a lot of the energy made it to the market here. Most of the energy is consumed by the industry itself. Very little is getting to the market, net energy. Now, another problem, and this is global oil discoveries continue to decline. The world is now consuming four barrels of oil for each one barrel it discovers. You don't have to be a brain surgeon or a nuclear physicist to figure this one out. This is global oil conventional discoveries from 2013 to 19, the ratio. We've consumed four barrels of conventional oil production and we have found one. Now you can't, that, that can't go on forever. And then this is the oil discovery since 1947. You can see they continue to decline even with the high oil prices of 100 in 11, 12, 13, and partially 14, that did not motivate uh, more uh, discoveries. Matter of fact, they continue to trend lower. This is a big problem. So uh, at some point in time, we're gonna run out of the, uh, uh, the oil production is, gonna, is going to fall and we don't we're not replacing the oil. And, and this is gonna lead to falling GDP. And now we come to the energy cliff. I'm seeing more examples of the energy cliff. The more you look, this was a chart by David Murphy, published it on the oil drum. I added these annotations showing the energy return on investment in the United States. And the blue area is the cost of the energy. The gray area is the net energy delivered to the market. Now, as we peak and decline, the energy cost becomes even greater, as I showed you right here. This is, this is the, the blue area right here. It's consuming so much more of the of the oil or the energy to get it, and and this is the this is the energy cliff right here. Even though it may not be as severe, there's a lot less net energy making it to the market. And as I uh, said in my thermodynamic oil collapse and future video interview with Dr. Louis Arnault, we see the same thing. And then interestingly, Gail Tverberg on our finite world. She's a uh, insurance actuary. She looks at a lot of numbers. She's not a conspiracy theorist. So she showed this chart a couple of weeks ago on her blog that this is the world oil uh, energy consumption. So we could see we're starting to see the energy cliff. Now, either the, all, this is all wrong or a lot of people just don't understand it. I believe people just don't understand it. Now, due to the Inefficient use of energy, uh, uh, we are seeing a lot of side effects, either pollution or climate change, if you want to call it, and we're going to run out of energy. So the solution has been by the powers that be or the folks that uh, the leaders in politics and the world that we're going to move to green energy. Unfortunately, green energy is not the solution or is renewable when the wind and solar power units reach the end of their functional lifespan and are dumped in the world landfills. Now, according to the data this year, 50,000 metric tons of wind turbines are supposed to head to the landfills. While some of this is recycled, most of it is not. It's just not economic. It's cheaper to just cut the blades and then put them in landfills. And the waste is forecasted to almost go up five times in the next 14 years. So this is not, this is not renewable. 
the wind is renewable because it will blow and the sun is renewable because it will shine, but wind and power units are not renewable. They get thrown out and they're not lasting as long as the forecasted 30, 25, 30 years. A lot of these things, the solar panels are not lasting that long. Even the wind turbines are starting to break down within 12 to 15 years. And I'm going to be putting out a gold member article on that. And then we have solar panel waste. This is a new slide I just put together. According to this study, it's the solar panel waste in the world is going to increase exponentially after 2030. It's going to be 8 million tons in 2030. It's going to increase 10 times to 80 million tons. So what is the equivalent of 8 million tons of solar panel waste? Well, with a Tesla weighing two tons, that's 4 million Teslas worth of solar panel waste. And then we could see that's 1.6 million African elephants. Again, uh, unfortunately, solar is a fo solar and wind are fossil fuel derivatives. You need fossil fuels to burn, to uh, to mine, extract the mineral, the, the minerals and materials, transport them to the manufacturing plants to make the solar and wind units. If we're going to have trouble with oil, then we're not going to be able to ramp up solar and wind, even if we wanted to. So that brings us back to this. The, the data shows we're heading towards an energy cliff. And when that, what that means is that means falling GDP, which means people out of work, and that's just going to continue to show an ongoing collapse of the economies. So while a lot of people believe we're going to head towards this, this is more the reality. Now, why is that important to understand? Because a lot of people are invested in this. This is the global mainstream asset universe as of December 2017. The analyst that put together this information has since left Savalas World Research, so no one is re, uh, updating the information. But at the time, there was $281 trillion in global real estate, commercial, residential, uh, industrial, airport, warehouse. And then there was $105 trillion in securitized debt or bonds. And then 83 trillion in equities. I believe this is up to 95 trillion now. The problem is stocks, bonds, and real estate aren't stores of value, but are energy IOUs. Why? Well, let's look at real estate right now. It's a perfect example. What's happening with the pandemic, people aren't going to work as much. They're working at home. So what is that doing to commercial real estate buildings, the offices? The the, the values are falling. There's uh the, there's all this commercial real estate and not much of it is being used now, people are staying home. And then there's the hotels, the, uh, real, the uh, retail uh, malls and buildings. Then there is uh, the food restaurants. So all this, this, re this real estate that uh, is not being used as much, the value is gonna fall. And that's just a preview of what's going to happen as oil production falls, the real estate it's going to fall even further. Residential is going to get hit, even though we're seeing a spike in U.S. residential home prices. That's that's not going to last. We're going to see a collapse in residential home prices as well. And then bonds, 10, 20, 30 year bonds. Even now we have 100 year bonds. So how do you pay those back? You have to have economic activity and to pay those back. Well, if we're having falling oil production, we're going to have falling uh, economic activity, thus bonds are in trouble. And then lastly, equities, their values are based on price to earnings. Well, if earnings, if, if uh, GDP is going to fall, then earnings are going to fall. And so the stocks are going to fall. So all these are in big trouble. Now, the, the, the gold and silver are stores of energy equivalent value because the gold coin, the gold bar, the value of it was burned in the past. The energy was burned in the past to produce that gold or silver coin, a bar. It's, so it's, that value is stored in there. These values are based upon future oil burning and they're based upon future growth in oil burning. And that's the problem. Now the gold mining industry production cost is about 1300 an ounce, 1250, 1300. Now it takes a little bit more to make the coin, but let's just say 1300 for round numbers. The US Treasury cost per $100 bill 
is 20 cents. They just updated that number. So if we print 13 bills, which equals $1,300 face value, it would cost a total of $2.60. Now, if you took the $1,300 to produce an ounce of gold and you, you purchased or you were able to print the bills, it, you could print $650,000 worth of $100 bills. And that's the reason why fiat currency doesn't have any intrinsic value because the energy it takes to produce it, $2.60 for uh, $1,300 is very little compared to uh, $1,300 to produce an ounce of gold. And that's basically where it comes down to. It's all about the energy. Most of that $1,300 is energy in one form or another, whether it's fuel, diesel, electricity, power, whether it's human labor, even the capital or the machines or the equipment and the materials. That's all based on energy. It's all the energy in all forms and stages to, to produce the gold. Now, it, it all comes back to this. Back in the day when banks held gold and silver in their vaults, they were massive stores of energy equivalent value. We have to, we have to visualize this. All the, the work in the community, in that local local area, all the people that when they were working, they had these, this, the, the profits was the energy profits of their work or the capital of the business. And they took that and they stored it in the bank. So the bank was a massive store of this energy equivalent value of the community or the state or the country. Today, we can see the forklift here delivering pallets of money. Today, banks are stores of paper currency or digital money that have no energy equivalent value, but are rather energy IOUs. Now we have to remember, a, even a hundred dollar bill has got the, the word note written on it. A note is not an asset, it's a liability. And, uh, and then it's backed up by all the debt in the United States, which is $27 trillion. So that is the difference today. And a lot of people, economists, investors don't understand that banks are not stores of energy equivalent value. They are energy IOUs. So the world will begin to transition from building wealth. You can only build wealth if, if you have an increase in energy in, in the economy to a new paradigm of protecting wealth with precious metals. So if you realize that the value of real estate, the value of bonds and stocks are gonna start getting into a lot of trouble, it doesn't look like it right now, but, uh, and that's just the face value, that's all being propped up by asset price inflation. If those are gonna really start getting into trouble, the, the only thing that's really going to protect wealth, or let's say the two most well-known with thousands of years of history are gold and silver because they're, they protect wealth because they protect energy equivalent value, which energy is the main driver of the economy. Energy equals money. Without energy, there is no money. And without energy, there is no economy. So we're back to this. We're back to, this is the mentality that we're gonna come across every day you walk in the public you, when you go to uh, holidays, Thanksgiving or Christmas, you're going to come across two people. Most people, this is what they believe in. Technology is going to solve all our problems. Well, if you read any of Joseph Tainer's Collapse of Complex Societies, it is plenty of history that the more complex a society became, the quicker it collapsed. And so we're heading in the same same situation, the same predicament, and everything was fine with growing oil production, but now we're facing the energy cliff, the whole thing starts to fall apart, and we are going to enter a depression that will never end, and an ongoing collapse of global economies. Well, I wanted to thank you, and I please share this video with friends and family. Um, they may not want to watch it, but I believe the data in here is pretty accurate. It's just a matter of time. I believe within the next five to 10 years, the world will be a, a much different place. And it has really nothing to do with the pandemic. That's just, the pandemic is part of the issue it, it, or the elite, the, they really can't solve the energy problem. Uh, it, people talk about the, the elite are the ones in charge and they're, they're trying to uh, 
cull the population. The energy cliff was going to do it regardless of the elite. The elite have no power. As a matter of fact, a lot of the elite's wealth is going to be wiped out as the energy cliff starts to, um, we start to see it move down. So thank you very much. If you have not yet subscribed to the SRS Rock Report YouTube channel, please consider doing so. And we also put out a lot of content for subscribers, gold and silver member subscribers at the SRS Rock Report. Thank you.